Jim Mugan, for those that don't know me, I'm Senior Vice President of Clinical Services, and I'm filling in for Holly today. But today we have an interesting program on hypertension and stroke care. But first, I'm going to start with a reflection. This one is called Let Go of Your. I'm oh, sorry. Oh, nice. I guess I would. <laughs> Let Go of Your stre Stressors. Can you hear me good? No, not my mouth. Can I just talk loud? Sure. <laughs> this one is called Let Go of Your Stressors. A psychologist walked around a room, walked around a room while teaching stress management to an audience. As she raised a glass of water, everyone expected the half empty or half full question. Instead, with a smile on her face, she inquired, how heavy is this glass of water? Answers ranged out from eight ounces to 20 ounces. She replied, the absolute weight doesn't matter. It, de it depends how long I hold it. If I hold it for a minute, it's not a problem. If I hold it for an hour, I'll have an ache in my arm. If I hold it for a day, my arm will feel numb and paralyzed. In each case, the weight of the glass doesn't change, but the longer I hold it, the heavier it becomes. She continued, the stressors and worried in, worries in life are like that glass of water. Think about them for a while and nothing happens. Think about them for a bit longer, they begin to hurt. And if you think about them all day long, you will feel paralyzed and incapable of doing anything. It's important to remember to let go of your stresses as early in the evening as you can to put your burdens down. Don't carry them through the evening and into the night. Remember to put the glass down. Of course, easier said than done. <laughs> For myself, I think most of the time I'm pretty good at that, other times not so much. All right, with that, I'm gonna do some introductions. So again, thank you for being here today and joining us. Today we have two excellent providers 
uh, who will discuss a health concern that is, is known as the biggest risk factor for stroke, hypertension. Also known as high blood pressure, it is a risk issue that can be controlled by changing your diet and lifestyle. We are fortunate to have two physicians here who will tell us what hypertension is and how it is related to stroke. Dr. Charles Washington, an emergency department physician, will talk to us first about what hypertension is, what causes it, who's at risk, and what can happen if hypertension is not controlled, and what the role of the team in the emergency department plays when an individual presents with stroke symptoms. Dr. Gu, a neurologist with Lakeside NeuroCare, will talk, to more, more, talk more about stroke risk factors and types of stroke. Please welcome me, welcome me in joining our first presenter, Dr. Charles Washington. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. My name is Dr. Charles Washington. I've been practicing here about eight years. Um, did my medical school and undergrad at the great University of Illinois. Go Illini. I know that is sacrilege up here in Wisconsin. And I uh, trained in emergency medicine at Ohio State University. For those up there in Columbus, they call it the Ohio State University. But uh, very uh, interesting over there in Ohio. Um, I've been practicing here, I think I said that already, about eight years. So today we're going to talk a little bit about hypertension and stroke. Um, this talk for me really is going to focus on what we do in the emergency department, how we deal with hypertension and how we deal with stroke, and uh, how we work with Dr. Gu in the neurology department. Um, the, the talk is kind of focused more on what to expect when you come to the emergency department, especially for those uh, that live in this community. Um, obviously, we have some other experts here uh, uh, in, in the uh, talk today. So the first thing is that uh, hypertension is pretty significant here in the U.S. About 46% of adults in the United States have hypertension. Um, so that's like 100 million people, okay? So it's the most common chronic condition that's uh, managed. Uh, by primary care physicians uh, in the United States. Um, so the prevalence of hypertension certainly causes a significant amount of uh, morbidity uh, in the United States. Particularly since today we're talking about stroke, it certainly is a risk factor uh, for uh, stroke. Um, and Dr. Gu will be talking a little bit more about that. Um, of course, the older you are, the more likely you're going to have hypertension. Okay. So. Um, one of the questions uh, that I was asked to talk about was, well, how do we define um, hypertension? So it's changed a little bit, um, but normal blood pressure technically is 120 uh, over 80. Um, you know, I have my colleagues here. Uh, they can tell you that it's pretty rare that we actually see anybody with normal blood pressure in the emergency department. Um, once you're above 120 over 80, um, the blood pressure is elevated. Um, and really the number um, used to be that hypertension was defined uh, anything above 140 over 90. Um, it's being treated a bit more aggressively because now it's 130 um, over, anything above 130 over 80 is now considered to be um, hypertension and that's when uh, lifestyle modifications and sometimes medications have to be, to, to be used. <laughs> so, um, you know, the diagnosis um, how do we diagnose um, hy hypertension? One of the things that happens to us in the emergency department quite a bit is someone will come into the emergency department, they've been in the department all of two to three minutes, they're very anxious, they're very nervous, um, you put a blood pressure cuff on, um, and uh, you know they have, the, they have white coat hypertension, so the blood pressure is 170 over 100, and they think, oh my gosh, my blood pressure's never been this high, do I have hypertension? We wait five minutes, and, the, and then the blood pressure is completely normal. Um, and so you, uh, unless the person's having a hypertensive emergency in the emergency department, um, we generally don't make that first diagnosis of hypertension in the emergency department setting. Generally, hypertension is going to be diagnosed, um, you know, through your primary care physician. And there's a few ways to do that. Um, you have uh, three types of blood pressure monitoring, office-based, ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, and then home blood pressure monitoring. Uh, the same kind of white coat, 
white coat hypertension happens in the primary care physician's office as well. So generally, when primary care physicians are making the diagnosis of hypertension, generally they're going to check your blood pressures, um, and then they're going to wait several days or a few weeks, and they want to take that blood pressure again in the same setting multiple times, usually about three times before they make that diagnosis. Uh, one of the other important things to know is what's your blood pressure at home, because that helps as well. So sometimes hypertension is diagnosed by having you take your blood pressures at home and document them morning, uh, midday, and evening, and then you bring those blood pressure uh, readings back to your primary care doctor where they can take a look at those, and many times the diagnosis is made there. You also have something called ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, and I don't know how many of the primary care doctors are doing this, but occasionally you'll have a patient where it's difficult to make that diagnosis of hypertension, and um, actually um, you can go home uh, with this uh, blood pressure cuff and monitoring system, and it basically takes your blood pressure about every 15 to 20 minutes for about 24 hours. Um, one of the important um, numbers that they look at is, you know, what, does, what is your blood pressure when you're resting or when you're asleep? Um, and then your primary care doctor can, can make the diagnosis that way. Um, so talk, talking a little bit about hypertensive urgencies or emergencies, that's what we deal with in the emergency department. And that diagnosis is basically when the blood pressure is above 180 over 120 and there's ongoing end organ damage, that is technically what we call a hypertensive emergency. This is what we deal with in the emergency department. And one of the things that I do want to mention, um, uh, especially in discussing with the community about how we deal with hypertension, um, on many occasions we'll have patients come to the emergency department simply because they took a blood, pressure mon a blood pressure reading at home, and at home the blood pressure was, let's say, 190 over 110, and they rush right into the emergency department, but they have no symptoms. And they sort of look at me in a gasp when I tell them, we're not going to do anything. And the biggest question is, well, why? You know, my blood pressure is 190 over 110. Something awful must be happening. Of course, many times we recheck that blood pressure in the emergency department, and it's normal. Um, really the only indication to lower your blood pressure fairly rapidly is if there's actually a target organ that's actively being damaged. So if your blood pressure is high and you have an intracerebral hemorrhage or a bleeding kind of a stroke, we want to decrease that blood pressure fairly rapidly. If you're having an aortic dissection and your blood pressure is very, very high, we want to decrease that blood pressure pretty rapidly. Um, and even then, the target is only to decrease that blood pressure by about 15 to 20 percent, except, of course, when you have an intracerebral bleed, we try to get that blood pressure down below 140. Other examples would be if you're having a big heart attack, um, if you are in acute congestive heart failure, or if you're in acute renal failure, those are the times when we decrease the blood pressure rapidly in the emergency department setting. Otherwise, we're going to do a good thorough examination, and if we don't find any of those target organs damaged, um, we talk to you about blood pressure, about getting back in to see your primary care doctor. And if your blood pressure truly is um, elevated, then it can be managed uh, on the outpatient basis, uh, lifestyle modifications, changing your blood pressure medications, those kinds of things. So hypertension alone in the emergency department setting um, is, is actually okay from the standpoint of we're not going to be doing uh, a lot of drastic lowering of your blood pressure unless there's any, uh, any organ damage occurring. So what are risk factors for high blood pressure? Age, um, obesity, family history, race, a high sodium diet, excessive alcohol consumption, um, physical inactivity. Um, those are the risk factors for uh, blood pressure. Um, so complications of high blood pressure, we talked. We just talked a little bit about it. So uh, long-standing, uncontrolled high blood pressure. You know, obviously today we're talking about stroke, uh, but it can certainly lead to kidney disease, can lead to congestive heart failure, um, coronary artery disease, uh, and eye disease. People can get retinopathies 
associated with hypertension that can affect your vision. Um, so one of the questions I was asked is, what are the symptoms of hypertension? And this is what kind of really is dangerous about hypertension is uh, many times it's asymptomatic. Um, you know, as physicians, we have seen those folks that walk into the emergency department, they've never had a doctor, they've never seen anyone before, their blood pressure can be 220 over 120 and they have zero symptoms. Sometimes they're there for some other reason, um, you know, abdominal pain or something else. Uh, and unfortunately, um, you don't always get um, a warning sign that your blood pressure is too high. This is why it's important to have your blood pressure routinely uh, checked by your primary care physician. You can even go into some of the pharmacies uh, and they can actually check your blood pressure as well. So, um, so since there's no symptoms for hypertension, these are some of the symptoms that can occur um, if there's um, end organ damage. So these are the kinds of symptoms that you should be seeking medical care for immediately. So if you have a severe headache that's uncommon for you, um, worst headache of life, um, but it really should be the worst headache of life. So we have patients that come to the emergency department and they say, this is the worst headache I've ever had. Then I look at, the, at their uh, records and they've been there 20 times for the worst headache, worst headache they've ever had. <laughs> So truly, if you have a sudden onset headache that's unusual for you, that could be very dangerous, and we want to see you for that. Things like acute loss of vision, even if it comes back, even if you lose your vision for a minute, two minutes, and that vision comes back, we want to see you. Um, crushing chest pain, severe chest pain, shortness of breath, trouble breathing, severe back pain or abdominal pain. So these are some of the symptoms that we want to see you for that can be associated with uncontrolled hypertension. So how do we treat it? So these are all the things that I should be doing. Um, so I'll be the first to say that I, I should be doing a lot of these things. So low salt diet, weight loss, um, a diet high in all the good stuff, fruits, vegetables, um, you know, chicken, um, low in sugar. Um, I wish I had Dr. Kermgard here. He could give you an entire dissertation on having a diet low in sugar. Um, so low in red meats. You want to exercise. Um, I know in uh, Wisconsin uh, that limited alcohol consumption can be a difficult thing. And then, of course, um, medications uh, for those that aren't responding to um, lifestyle modification. So we talked a little bit about this earlier. So in the emergency department, um, if you don't have any symptoms, it's going to be gradual lowering of that high blood pressure as an outpatient. If you are having one of these um, disease processes, whether you're having a big heart attack or heart failure, stroke, um, intracerebral hemorrhage, um, acute congestive heart failure, dissection, those are the true hypertensive emergencies, and, and, you, and we're going to be addressing that hypertension aggressively. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about stroke before Dr. Gu comes up about the pre-hospital setting and then what happens in the emergency department. So one of the things that you could do in the community to help us out is just to remember these four letters, FAST, F-A-S-T, and then call 911. So if you're sitting in church, or you're at a family reunion, you're watching the Packer game, uh, and uh, you notice that someone's uh, not acting appropriately, uh, the F stands for facial drooping. So ask the person to smile. If you notice that there is asymmetry or one side of the face is drooping, they may be having a stroke, go ahead and call 911. Um, don't sit around and worry about, well, are they really having a problem or not? Just call 911 and get them here as fast as you can. And I'll tell you why that's really important in just a minute. So arm weakness, so the A stands for arm weakness. Ask the person to raise both of their hands up. If you notice that there's drift on one side or that the person can't bring that arm up, they may be having a stroke, okay? The S stands for speech difficulty. You can ask them really to repeat any question or repeat any sentence. But if you use the sky is blue, um, and, uh, and they can't say that, or uh, it's muffled, or garbled, or slurred, or they can't say it at all, potentially they, they could be having a stroke. And, it's, and T is for to call 911 and get them here as fast as you possibly can. 
Um, and that's just sort of a <clears throat> image there of those same things that we just talked about. So FAST, F-A-S-T, F is for face, A is for arms, S is for speech, T is time to call 911, okay? Um, other things that could be a stroke, okay, other than those, I just wanted to mention that, is if they're acutely confused. You're talking to them two minutes later, who am I, where am I, what's going on. If they don't act, think that they don't seem like they know what they're doing, those are also symptoms of stroke. Um, we talked about vision problems. This is the one that's a little bit <clears throat> kind of a sleeper, which is dizziness and sometimes loss of balance. We want to see those patients too. Now many times our patients that come in who are dizzy, it's not a stroke. But, but, cert, but there is a type of stroke um, that can cause you to lose your balance and have dizziness. So if a person's never had balance problems before, never had issues with dizziness, um, and especially if it's acute onset, meaning it, they're, they're normal and a few minutes later they're having this problem, we want to see those patients as well, okay? So you can call 911 and get those folks here quickly as well. <clears throat> and we talked about the severe headache. Um, so what happens when you come, you've called 911, person comes here, one of the things that you'll notice pretty quickly is we literally jump on top of you, okay? That's okay, all right? Now if I'm actually in the bed with you, that's a problem. <laughs> um, but, uh, that happens sometimes with hip dislocations, by the way. Um, but anyways, um, so you'll hear this thing that we call code stroke track one. Basically, all of our resources, physicians, nurses, lab, CT, x-ray, Dr. Gugit's page, um, we're all on top of you right away. Many times, we'll actually send you over for a CT scan even before I've actually had the chance to examine you. Um, because one of the big things that we do, um, or the most important thing that we do, is we need to know right away whether this stroke is a bleeding kind of a stroke or a non-bleeding kind of a stroke. And Dr. Google will talk to you a little bit more about that. Um, you know, we're going to be drawing those labs. Nurses will be doing an EKG. They're going to be putting a couple of IVs in you right away. And I'll be doing an exam. Um, once the head CT scan is done, um, and if there's no bleeding kind of a stroke, um, you may potentially be a candidate for a medication that we give for ischemic stroke or the non-bleeding kind of stroke called TPA. Um, and at the same time, many times while you're still on the table, we'll do a second CT, so this is in rapid succession, where we actually do a CT looking at the vessels in the brain because we're looking for a clot that might be blocking the vessel causing you to have that stroke, okay? Um, so we're talking a little bit about high blood pressure. And this is where it gets a little bit complicated, but if you do have high blood pressure and it's too high to give you this, this drug called TPA, we do give medications to try to lower you below 185 over 110. If we can get you below that and we can maintain that, and we can give you this drug. Now you're gonna be, you're gonna hear a lot about IV TPA in the community, commercials, you know, literature. And basically it's a medication that can sometimes dissolve or break up a clot that's causing you to have the stroke. It's not though the magic bullet or wonder drug like people want to say it is, um, because it doesn't work for every single patient and there are some patients who cannot have TPA. And probably the <coughs> problem we run into the most is when people have, ha have had the symptoms longer than three hours. That's why it's so crucially important when you see any of those fast symptoms, you gotta get the person here as soon as you can. Now there are other reasons why we may not give this drug. Let's say you're on blood thinners already where we can't give that medication. Or if you've had a bleeding kind of stroke before, then we can't give this particular medication. Now for the most part, the window, meaning from the time you have the symptoms to the time we can give the medication, generally we wanna, that really should be within about three hours. Now, we can give this up to about four and a half hours, but not for everybody. 
So that's why I like to tell people in the community that three hour number. Now that you might fall into that category where you're out for about four and a half hours and we can still give the medication. The reason why we can't give that beyond that time is because then it becomes a bit dangerous where the risk of you bleeding becomes too high to give this particular medication. Now, there is a fairly new treatment on the scene, you know, called endovascular therapy. It's very similar to when patients have a heart attack and they go to the cath lab. Um, we do have what we call neurointerventionalists who will do a catheter or angiography of the brain and if they can get to that clot, um, they can actually do what we call a thrombectomy, meaning they can actually remove that clot. Um, it used to be that the window for that was six to eight hours after stroke symptoms. There's been a new study that's come out recently that says that you might be a candidate for that even up to 24 hours. Now, that doesn't mean that you can kind of sit at home and finish the Packer game. Um, it still means you got to get here as soon as you can. <clears throat> the way that that endovascular therapy works, by the way, um, just in case you were wondering how we deal with it here, <clears throat> the group of radiologists that we have here, our interventionalists, they actually do that procedure, but they do it up at uh, Theta. So if you're in that situation where we tell you, hey, there's a clot, we think we can get to it, um, many times we fly you up there where they have all the equipment to do this procedure. Kind of the nice thing about that is that the same radiologist who just read your CT, who just diagnosed the stroke, who just saw the clot, many times it's the same exact guys who are going to be doing the thrombectomy. Okay. Um, so the best things you can do to help me to do a great job at taking care of your stroke is if you can remember anything at all about mm -hmm. what has happened, uh, when, you, when you bring that person to the emergency department is, when did those symptoms start? That is the most crucial thing that you can help me with, is if you can just remember the time that those symptoms started. Um, that's the most crucial thing you can help me with. The other thing is, if you don't know when those symptoms really started, then tell me the last time you saw the patient was normal. So those are the two most critical things to help us to do a great job. Uh, the other thing um, is if you can bring the patient's medications, that really, really, really helps us. We occasionally take care of patients who've never been here before, or we don't have an updated list, and it's kind of nice to know if they're on a blood thinner <laughs> before we uh, start to mix that drug. So those are the big three things. If you, can, if you can remember when it started, and if you can tell me, if you don't know that, if you can tell me when the last time they were normal, if you can bring those medications, that will help us uh, the most in taking care of stroke in the emergency department. Okay. I don't know if questions now or questions after Dr. Gu, but if, I don't know if you have any questions for me. What does it mean if your blood pressure, if the, the top number is high and the bottom number is low? Okay. So the top number is, um, you mean in, in the emergency department setting? No, or just, just in a regular. Ju just in a regular setting? Yeah. Well, the top number is what we call the systolic blood pressure. So systolic means when your heart is sort of squeezing and pumping. That's, the, that's that top number. Diastolic is when the heart is, is resting and that's kind of your resting blood pressure. Um, so you, we do see patients who may have a lower diastolic than they do um, uh, for blood pressure. Um, uh, let me step back. For the systolic, if your diastolic is below 80, but even if your systolic is above 130, above that 140 that we talked about, then you would still be considered to have hypertension, um, and it still needs to be addressed. So that's what that top number means versus that bottom number. Okay. So even if one is real high and one is real low. Mm -hmm. okay. and, and, and the one to really watch is when the diastolic is high. Because a person may say, well, my top number is always 130, 135, 140. But if that bottom number is above 80, like in the 90 or 95, then that still has to be true. Anything else?
Thank you, Dr. Washington. And uh, that was a very informative. I also want to mention that uh, Dr. Washington and his colleagues, all the people in emergency room are doing a wonderful job in taking care of stroke patients. And uh, over the years, we work together to improve our quality and uh, try to implement the most recent treatment for stroke. And we have been working together very well, so it's very nice. And um, anybody show up in the emergency with a stroke is going to get a very good care. Um, before I get on my slides, I just want to make some uh, general comments regarding stroke. Um, as a neurologist, I've been seeing stroke patients every day, treating them every day. And I can uh, tell you that the stroke treatment has evolved uh, tremendously over the years. As you know that uh, stroke effect in the brain when people have stroke, they lose their ability to talk and move. Some people are so um, impaired they have to spend the rest of life in the uh, nursing home. So that's a very big uh, public health problem. Um, so over the years, a lot of resource has been devoted in um, stroke research and treatment. So a lot of new ideas, and new understanding of stroke has uh, come along and we try to implement them as fast as we can. And um, stroke is not uh, like a static process, like head stroke, and that's all that is. And the stroke is a dynamic process. When people have a stroke, uh, the brain cell began to die, but they don't die all at once at the moment. They began to die in about uh, four minutes, and some of the cells die in about uh, 30 minutes, one hour, 24 hours. So the treatment for stroke is uh, to prevent those uh, cells uh, continue to die. So that's why all the stroke treatments are designed to that. And um, as we can tell, time is the essence. If patients show up early, we can intervene early, prevent the cells from dying, and uh, the stroke won't get worse. So that's the main problem we are facing right now. And uh, we can go more, in de in, uh, more into details regarding that. So we can get the next slide. <coughs> Stroke can be caused by a lot of things, but a lot of things of this can be prevented. Uh, some people say that 80% uh, stroke can be prevented if you can eliminate these risk factors. So that's uh, tremendous. And uh, I'm just going to one by one to go, them, go over them. The high blood pressure, we all know that. And uh, when people have high blood pressure, what happens, those blood vessels become hardened and they begin to close off. And when that happens, that will impair blood supply to the brain. And as you know, the brain needs a blood supply to survive, to function. When those blood vessels close off, then people have stroke. And also, with people have high blood pressure, because the um, blood pressure so high, begin to damage the vessel's wall, just like uh, the waves. Uh, in the ocean, you have bigger waves, uh, violent uh, storms that erode the shoreline. This is the same idea with the blood vessel. If the blood pressure is too high, it just uh, damages the, the walls. The wall used to be smooth, uh, very, uh, all the cholesterol, the blood uh, products just glide through. When the wall is damaged, it becomes rough, and um, all these things begin to deposit on it. And uh, the day in, day out, that begin to close the blood vessel causing stroke or heart attack for that reason. And the high cholesterol, the next one. So this one is um, part of that is due to diet. And if you have high cholesterol diet, obviously the cholesterol can be high. Some of the high cholesterol can be genetic. Some people just have a hard time to get the cholesterol down. Whatever they eat is just um, convert into cholesterol. So no matter how healthy Food they eat, they still have cholesterol, high cholesterol. So this type of patient need to be treated with uh, statin or some other medications. It's just uh, um, somebody who just cannot get the cholesterol down by eating healthy. And uh, diabetes is another common disease and that also contributes to stroke. The reason for that, that when people have diabetes, it's not just the blood sugar that is the problem. They also have some other changes, and one of them is the blood vessel. When people have high, have high um, blood sugar with the diabetes, their blood vessels become more fragile. They become inflamed, and then they can clog up and cause a stroke. 
And smoking is another thing. This is one of the party, uh, the bad example that a stroke and heart attack can be prevented by lifestyle change. When people are smoke, what happens is, uh, again, the, they begin to erode the lining of the endothelia, the lining of the blood vessel. And uh, for smokers, also the lining began to peel off. And when that happens, it's just like an old pipe. And uh, easy to, for the debris, everything to adhere to and clog up. So that's the reason for people to have a stroke or heart attack with smoking. Atrial fibrillation, is, uh, we know that is an irregular heart rhythm. When people have atrial fibrillation, the atrium do not um, contract rhythmically to squeeze the blood out of the atrium to the, uh, to the ventricle. So all the blood becomes stagnant in the ventricle system. And when that happens, the blood begins to clot. And when that clot becomes dislodged, it goes through the circulation, which go to the brain, that would block the blood vessel and cause a stroke. So those stroke usually more severe, more devastating happen quickly because the clot tends to be big. And depending on how big the blood vessel is blocked, the stroke uh, severity can be different. And uh, another one is other heart disease like congestive heart failure um, and obesity. When people are obese, then all the other tend to happen. So it's another reason you can get to the next slide. There are some less known, less common actually, um, risk factors for stroke, why is the vasculitis, that's the inflammation of blood vessel. That can happen when people have lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, or uh, colitis, uh, Crohn's disease, uh, those are the same uh, autoimmune process. Uh, those diseases can affect the blood vessel, cause them to inflame, and then close up, causing stroke. So those conditions need to be treated too. And uh, hyperfibrosis state, that means uh, there are some chemicals, abnormal chemicals uh, circulating in the blood that can make the platelet and all the clotting factors uh, get together, causing the um, uh, clot and uh, blocking the blood flow. And uh, the common one we tend to see is uh, hyperfibrosis state is um, phospholipid antibodies. Those are things we tend to screen. We don't do those uh, hyperglycemic studies routinely. Uh, we tend to do those for the people who are younger, do not have those common risk factors. So we have a panel to go through, and uh, that's pretty standard for everybody. And uh, the next one is the AV malformation. That is abnormal blood vessel in the brain, and uh, the arteries and the veins uh, become irregular. They impede blood flow, so they can cause blood clot that way. And uh, other things are sickle cell disease, estrogen, birth control. Um, birth control does increase the risk of a stroke. And um, the stroke uh, risk was not very high, but if somebody had a complicated migraine or had a stroke or TIA, they should not be taking estrogen or any birth control pills because that's just an increased risk of uh, having another stroke. If people don't have those, um, uh, stroke um, history or TI history may be okay to continue to take it, but that had to be in the context of uh, other factors. If people have hypertension, diabetes, high cholesterol, so that may not be a good idea to take birth control pills because there's one more risk factor added to it. And uh, drug abuse, alcohol, and sleep apnea are the other things that can contribute to stroke too. Uh, there are different types of strokes. The stroke, as I mentioned, is we refer to ischemic stroke. That's the majority of the stroke. That's uh, due to a blockage of artery, uh, like here, that uh, causes ischemic stroke. And it looks pale um, when you look at the brain. Then there's a hemorrhagic stroke. That's due to rupture of the blood vessel. The blood is just uh, bled into the brain that causes a blood clot. We call it hematoma. But mostly we talk about this skinny stroke. That's by far the majority of the stroke. <coughs> now I come back to about the blood pressure since we are talking about blood pressure today. Um, uh, blood pressure control is an uh, important part of acute stroke uh, management. Um, 
If uh, people are normal, the brain has a way to self-regulate the blood flow. The blood flow to the brain is usually constant uh, with uh, fluctuation of blood pressure throughout the day. Uh, when the blood pressure is low, the brain blood vessel open up to get more blood supply to the brain. When, blood, when the blood pressure is getting high, they close off, so reduce blood flow to the brain. So in general, just keep the steady. But in stroke patients, this self-auto-regulation became impaired. It can no longer regulate uh, the blood flow according to blood pressure change. When the blood pressure is too low, they cannot open up anymore. So reduce blood flow to the brain, that will cause damage, further damage to the brain. So therefore, when patients first come to the floor or they uh, come, come to the ICU after treatment uh, at the emergency room, we give them a so-called permissive uh, hypertension. Keep blood pressure relatively high for the first couple of days. Uh, let patients stable, then we get to treat the blood pressure. So uh, that's why when people come in, we don't rush in to give them blood pressure medication to lower the blood pressure because it can be dangerous, it can be harmful to the brain. That's uh, the reason to do that. And uh, there are some parameters, but uh, in general, Y80 should be fine shortly after stroke in the first few days. After that, we begin to treat them as normal we would to control the risk factors. <coughs> And that's the same idea. And uh, so blood pressure can be, the top blood pressure can be as high as one, as a 220, we can let them go that way for uh, a day or two. And as long as the patient does not have other symptoms like a hypertensive crisis and other end organ damage, we let them just stay high. So this is just a, uh, the CAT scan we see when patients come with a stroke, and uh, this side is normal. Uh, this is the brain, this is the ventricle, this is the skull. And the hemorrhagic stroke is we can see is pretty obvious, uh, the blood clot here. And that's the first thing we do when Dr. Washington see a patient, they send them to the scan, just looking for this. If uh, not here, then patient would be a candidate for TPA for aggressive treatment. The stroke symptom, as we know, uh, stroke is a brain disease, and the brain control all the voluntary function. And if people are having a sudden loss of any voluntary function, normally we can control, that's your stroke symptom. For example, uh, if you suddenly become numb anywhere, you cannot feel anymore, or suddenly become weak, cannot talk, or cannot move arm or the legs, uh, that will be a stroke symptom. <coughs> and uh, trouble talking, uh, like uh, aphasia, that it can be uh, expressive aphasia, have trouble getting your thoughts out. And uh, also have receptive aphasia, that is, uh, cannot understand what people are saying. So anything with a communication problem, sudden loss of ability to communicate. And uh, sudden trouble seeing, that's another thing, normally, everybody can see, but if well, people lose ability to see or cannot focus, that will be a stroke symptom. And uh, trouble walking, feeling dizzy, loss of balance, um, that could be a sound stroke, can be many other things, but the first thing we should consider would be a stroke. And uh, severe headache. Uh, I think Dr. Washington talked about the facts. Uh, as we um, have been uh, um, working on the stroke uh, symptoms, I think uh, the fast is not as uh, uh, sensitive, but people begin to use uh, be fast and they include the loss of balance and the eye symptoms, sudden loss of vision, trouble seeing. So be fast and would be what we try to tell people when you have all these symptoms, it just comes to the you. So I think I've probably done with it. Uh, um, well, this piece I just want to conclude with these slides. Uh, it's very important to come early. Uh, the time is uh, uh, very important. 
and time is the brain cells. And uh, when people have stroke symptoms come in right away, if they don't come, we cannot treat them. And uh, just sitting at home, the brain cells continue to die and get worse. If they come in early, we can sim some of the brain cells and minimize the stroke symptoms and have better recovery. Um, so that would be the take home message when you talk to your relative or friends or anybody, this is very important. And they need to come to the emergency room to have the brain cells saved. So we, we can do something right now, not like in the old days. Um, when people are stroke, we cannot do anything. Right now we can do something with the TPA endovascular intervention. And uh, I happen to be uh, working with uh, rehabilitation patients. And once this uh, new treatment began to be implemented, we realized we have fewer patients who need um, rehab because once they have TPA and uh, endovascular intervention, they go home directly. They, they have less impairment. So that's why our still our rehab patients become smaller population. So that's a good thing. So it's very important. This treatment does help. And uh, I think stroke is still evolving as we talk about. And um, uh, Nick and I are responsible for writing the protocols for our hospital patients to treat how to treat stroke when they come in in the emergency room on the floor, ICU, how to treat them. And, uh, and we realize that the development becomes so fast that each time we finish writing, we need to revise it again. And it looks like we are constantly working on it. So that's a good thing, that each time we revise, I think we are helping more patients. That's a good thing. And we just like I was talking about the computer and the iPhones. It's like the new iPhones become out of date and new ones come up. <laughs> Stroke is almost like this. It's just a very exciting time. It's began to change. So. Uh, um, so I just want to let you know that uh, stroke can be treated now and come early. Okay, that's uh, if you have any questions. Any questions for Dr. Gu or Dr. Washington? Actually, is there a rule, or what is the rule for like when a patient's been treated for TPA to when they can get a thrombectomy? It can happen immediately. Okay. Um, usually what we do is we go ahead and we hang the TPA. And many times we even hang that TPA before the CT angio is even completed. That's that second <laughs> CT we were talking about. So I'll go ahead and hang that TPA and you'll get the drug mm -hmm. if you meet the criteria. And then if we find a lesion that's amenable to endovascular therapy, then it can be done right away. Yeah, right now it's, uh, that's another evolving field. The endovascular intervention becomes so effective and people become more and more convinced as a treatment of choice at times. And uh, for this uh, community, that's pretty uh, typical. We come to see any hospital because no other hospital. In the bigger cities like Milwaukee or Chicago, they have been debated where to send a stroke patient. Do you send them to come in the hospital, get TPA first, and decide them need an intervascular intervention, or just go straight to the big center where everything's available? So that has been a part of the debate, just because we begin to know more about uh, the treatment. And that's another evolving thing. Any other questions? And you know, the, our other hospitals can give TPA too, by the way. Um, for instance, let's say you're in Wapan and a person's having stroke symptoms and they're sent there. I've actually pushed TPA down there too. That, that's why I wanted to just bring that up is that it is really important, at least in this community, to really go to the closest um, facility um, for stroke care. Anything else? Yeah, well, well I'll, be, I'll wait a bit for that. <laughs> if nothing else, thank you, Dr. Washington and Dr. Gu. I, I do apologize. I had to duck out. I did have a biometric screening appointment. <laughs> and that's so I reduces my chances of having a stroke.